go. All right, here we go. Let's talk eschatology. Now, specifically what I want to focus on in this video is an answer to the question, who is the he of Daniel 9.27? In answering this important question, I will have to focus quite a bit on the 70th week of Daniel in general. And so as most people know that follow this channel, I have written a comprehensive book on the topic, uh, End Times Revealed, Dawn of the Antichrist. And so this book gets into a variety of topics related to the end times debate. And that includes a detailed chapter on the 70th week of Daniel. I answer the question, who is the he in Daniel 9.27? I go over the various rapture positions and demonstrate sufficiently that the post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture eschatological model is the biblical model. It's what best fits the Bible and also reality. So if you have not yet, uh, yet read this book or picked up this book, I highly recommend it. It's 300 plus pages and it touches on nearly everything related to, to this debate. I've also engaged in numerous informal and formal debates on eschatology, including at least two debates on the question of Daniel's 70th week. Now, I do want to point out that this is eschatology and eschatology within the body of Christ is a secondary issue. And so there are those who would disagree with my answer to the question, who is the he of Daniel 9.27 and the status of Daniel's 70th week. And that's okay. Now, of course, I believe that the position I will be covering in this video is the accurate position. It's the biblical position. I have put forth numerous challenges and arguments over the last year and a half to two years that I have not seen addressed. The arguments and objections to the specific position that I hold to, I have addressed thoroughly in a video series that I've done. So please check my playlist, End Times Theology with Donnie. There's got to be close to 30 videos in there. I've got a whole series within that series on preterism and dealing with the topic of Daniel's 70th week. Again, I've engaged in uh, both formal and informal debates on this topic. And so I've covered this extensively. Therefore, I'm not going to rehash a lot of the things that I've already uh, covered in detail, but I will go over most things briefly in order to set the stage for answering this important question. But if you are looking for an incredibly comprehensive examination of each point, I highly recommend checking out the book, but also uh, my playlist and and past debates. And so let's get right into this and start off by going over these passages in Daniel 9. And so let's start from the beginning. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So we have 70 weeks here. Almost all people that I can think of agree that these are 70 weeks of years. And these 70 weeks will fulfill a number of important prophecies. And so what I want to do is go to a separate slideshow here and cover exactly what those things are. 
So you'll notice here, the 70 weeks will accomplish these things, finishing the transgression, making an end to sin, so on and so forth, what we just read over. And so the question is, have these things been fulfilled in the past? Are they going to be fulfilled in the future? Were they partially fulfilled in the past and therefore will be uh, fulfilled in their entirety in the future? The first thing I want to point out is the gaps in the 70 weeks. Because a lot of people, they'll, they'll ask, where are these gaps? Where are these hypothetical gaps? Well, firstly, you read in the passage itself, okay, starting with verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandments to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So you have seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. Verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So we have God breaking up the 70 weeks into three phases or components for us. And so we don't have to wonder if there are distinct components to the 70 weeks because God has already established that there are three elements to Daniel's 70 weeks. And so we got seven weeks and then 62 weeks and then one week. In total, we have 70 weeks that will fulfill some amazing and, and very significant prophecies here. Okay. And so let's go back to this slide again. We read there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So in total, that's 69 weeks. There's a gap between the 69th and the 70th week, but there's also a gap between the seventh week and the eighth week as well. So you got seven weeks, then a gap. Then there are 62 weeks and then another gap and then the 70th week. Okay. So right here, it comes in three phases. It's not 69 weeks and then one week. It's seven, then 62, and then one. So you got a gap between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks. And then you've got a gap between the 69th and the seven weeks or the, the final week. What is the seven weeks for? Okay. So the seven weeks we understand is getting the temple wall and street built. Right. We know it took time to build the temple, the wall and the street. Seven times seven, you got 49 years. Specifically, uh, verse 25 deals with this. The, the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. So you've got the seven weeks. They end with everything being built. Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ ends the 62 weeks. And so when does Messiah get off according, get cut off according to Daniel 9, 25, and 26? Well, firstly, I want to ask the question, does it say that Messiah is cut off in the middle of the week? No, it says after 69 weeks, right? Notice, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Okay, so we have Messiah after 69 weeks, boom, Messiah is cut off, which means we are counting seven weeks, 62 weeks, so that's 69 weeks in total, then Messiah is cut off. It doesn't say, well, sometime after the 69th week or the 69 weeks into the 70th week, Messiah is cut off. No, the 70 weeks are chopped up. Three components, seven, then 62, and then one. It's after the 69 weeks, you're counting. One, two, three, up to 60, up to 69, and then boom. Messiah is cut off, but not for himself, for you and me and for the world. Remember, the Jews at this time, they were expecting the Messiah to come about and bring them back into their former triumph or their former glory. They weren't expecting Messiah to be cut off. They weren't ex expecting uh, Messiah to die for the sins of the world, right? That's what it predicts here for you, for me, for, for the world. And what he did, as we know, is, is he rose. He rose again, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this is a beautiful prophecy of the substitutionary atonement. 
Okay, so let's go to the next phase. Now we know what the seven weeks fulfilled. Okay, we can get into the proclamation, the decree, and all that. I've done that in in the past. Okay, now we have the sixty-two weeks, seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. After the sixty-nine weeks, Messiah is cut off. Daniel 9, 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And so the question is, who is the he here of Daniel 9, 27? Well, notice we have uh, he, the pronoun he. And so where there's a pronoun, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, there should be an antecedent to that pronoun. So for example, if I said he, he is good at baseball, you would ask, well, who, who are you talking about? But if I were to say, John likes baseball, he is good at baseball. Okay. So you know that the antecedent to the pronoun he he is good at baseball, is John. John likes baseball. He is good at baseball. And so the previous verse should tell us what the antecedent is. Well, firstly, the last singular noun that is mentioned is what? It's prince, as in people of the prince that shall come. Notice here. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And so this people, this pr uh, prince right here, the people of the prince, that would be your nearest antecedent. Well, the question is, after Messiah was cut off, was there a people and was there a prince that came and destroyed the city and destroyed the sanctuary, Jerusalem and the, the temple? And the answer is yes. After Jesus was cut off, there was a bit of a gap from 33 AD to 70 AD. But in 70 AD, um, right in the middle of what's called the Jewish-Roman War. So it was a seven-year war, and right in the middle of that war, the temple was destroyed and the city was destroyed. Well, who is the prince? Well, we understand that the prince was Titus, Commander Titus, who led the Roman army into Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple and destroyed the city. This is an amazing fulfilled prophecy because it's to a T in all of its details. Notice, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And so that's seven years, weeks of years, where every day is a year. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Okay, so if it goes back to uh, the people of the prince. Now, I do want to point out that just because what we're looking at here is an object of a preposition does not stop it at all from being the antecedent, as I've seen many argue. For example, what if I went to my friend's house and my friend gave me coffee? So if I said, I went over to my friend's house and he gave me coffee, this is a perfectly reasonable way to imply that my friend is the one who served me coffee. I went to the house of my friend and we had coffee together. And so those that argue, well, the text says it's the people of the prince rather than the prince himself, and so the prince can't be the antecedent, are essentially just making stuff up. There is no rule that says the immediate antecedent can't be the prince as in the people of the prince. The object of a preposition can still be the antecedent of a subject pronoun. And this is reality. And so the arguments that I have heard to overcome the clear answer to what is the antecedent to the he and Daniel 9, 27 have really fallen short because most people want to bring the uh, he back to Messiah right here at the start of verse 26 or the prince here in verse 25, which is clearly referring to Jesus, the Messiah, because they want to say that the he specific, because we, we, we've got a prophecy of Jesus, the Messiah. He's cut off. He's cut off after 69 weeks. This is the substitutionary atonement because he's cut off, not for himself, but for you, for me, for the world.
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so this is a beautiful prophecy of the coming of Jesus and the substitutionary atonement. Then we get a separate prophecy, verse 27. Well, again, this fits perfectly with the context as we are going to see, because the most important way to determine who the he is, is through the context. History has confirmed this. Because again, we know through history that there is the seven-year Jewish Roman War. And in the midst of that war, it started in 66 AD, it ended in 73 AD. This was after Messiah was cut off. Do you see how it flows beautifully? It's consistent. So Messiah is cut off. And in 70 AD, so 33 AD to 70 AD, you got a bit of a gap, which makes sense of your dual prophecy fulfillments because we've also got a gap from 33 AD in the more dramatic sense and the end times as we read about in Revelation. But we'll touch on that in a little bit. Okay. And so we have, after Messiah being cut off, we have this Jewish Roman war. Seven years in the middle of the war, uh, the people of the prince, Titus, and the Roman army come in. They destroy the city and the temple. And as a result, they literally, they literally stop the sacrifice because the Jews were still sacrificing animals, unfortunately. And Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world. And so those animal sacrifices were not doing anything. Jesus negated the, 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 necess um, the necessity of animal sacrifices. And so those were an abomination, those, those animal sacrifices. The Jews were called to repentance. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And their sins, past, present, and future, would be forgiven. Romans 4 makes it clear. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And it also talks about how he will not impute sin. Future, future tense, okay? And so the Jews were still sacrificing animals, but Emperor Titus, or Commander Titus at that time, came in. Here we've got some sources. Uh, Commander Titus, I've got some here too, but I'd like to, right here. Seven-year Jewish-Roman War. The first Jewish-Roman War, 66 to 73 Guys, this is not a coincidence that we have a seven-year war, and right in the middle of that war is when the uh, city and the temple are destroyed. And so you can see all the sources here. Well understood and established that, that this was seven years. On June 5th in 70 AD, during the siege of Jerusalem, Titus and his Roman legions breached the city's middle wall. And so it was 70 AD, three and a half years into this war. This is when Jerusalem was sacked. This is when the temple was destroyed. And as a result, this is cause and effect. The result of the temple being destroyed was a literal stopping to the animal sacrifices. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman emperor Titus. And it uh, talks about how, so for example, here, Titus was the one who destroyed Jerusalem and made it fall. And so this fits perfectly with Daniel 9.27, which talks about, or Daniel 9.26 specifically, talks about the people of the prince coming in to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Titus had returned to Rome in 70 AD after he had conquered Jerusalem. He was given a triumph or military celebration for his victory and was considered a great Roman general. Now, it's interesting because Titus, he was given a military celebration for his victory, okay? But it was literally his people, the people of the prince, because that's the army. He's commanding the army. And so the army goes in and they destroy the temple and the city. And so that's why it makes sense that Daniel 9, 25 here would actually say the people of the prince. Because although in a way it is Titus, but it is Titus commanding the army that goes in. And so the people of the prince are the ones that literally destroy the temple, but it is the prince himself that is commanding that army, that is in charge of that army. And so it fits nicely with history. It fits perfectly with, uh, with the Bible. You can see all that for, for yourself. 
I'll go back to this slide here. The same uh, sources confirming what what I said. And so I do want to get into Antiochus Epiphanes in just a bit and show you how that fits in light of dual prophecy fulfillment. But Daniel 9.27, just to recap. Okay, the last singular noun that is mentioned is prince, as in people of the prince that shall come. Therefore, the prince is the antecedent to the he in Daniel 9.27. And as I'm going to show you, context as well. Because a lot of people say, oh, but you don't find Antichrist or Titus anywhere in the context. Well, firstly, the chapter divisions where you've got Daniel 9.27, Daniel 9.25, as we all know, these were added after the fact for ease of navigating through the Bible. And so you can't just read Daniel 9 and isolate it from the rest of the book of Daniel. No, you have to read Daniel 7. You have to read Daniel 8, Daniel 9, 10, 11, 12. And when you get the full picture, when you get the full context, read before, everything before, read everything after. This is Biblical Hermeneutics 101, Bible Interpretation 101. Read everything after, read everything before, and read the whole book. Understand the book in its entirety. and you'll get this right. You won't mess it up. And so we see uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in Daniel 8, who is a shadow of the future Antichrist. You're going to see that he's the one that takes away the sacrifice. He's the one that sets up the abomination of desolation. So the one who takes away the sacrifice is also setting up the abomination of desolation, this image. And so no, it's not Jesus Christ. It's not Messiah that's setting up the abomination of desolation. He's not the desolator. And uh, Daniel 11 is clear as well. And Daniel 12 is as well, that we have an Antichrist figure, specifically at that time with Antiochus Epiphanes, as I'll get into shortly, who is setting up an image. He's also taking away the daily sacrifice. And Daniel 11 emphasizes the fact, again, that it's the people that are the ones that are specifically uh, taking away the daily sacrifice by destroying the temple and then uh, setting up the image. Okay, and so again, the fact that it is an object of a preposition does not stop it from being the antecedent. I've gone over uh, at least one example. Here's another. What if I said I went over to our pastor's house and he fed me lunch? Or what if I said I went to the house of the Lord and I worshiped him? Just because it says the people of the prince does not mean the prince cannot be the antecedent. There are many verses throughout the Bible where the object of a preposition can still be the antecedent of a subject pronoun. But nonetheless, the strongest reason for why the he in Daniel 9.27 is the Antichrist is because of the corroborating evidence found in Daniel 7, 8, 11, and 12. And to say that this is Jesus and that there's nothing to see in the future with uh, Daniel's 70th week and there's, there's no shadow fulfillment with a more literal fulfillment in the end times. That theory doesn't work because I want to know what is the second three and a half years. Some will say, oh, well, it's it's the stoning of, of Stephen. But I'd like to know, okay, where's the chapter and verse for that? Where does the Bible demonstrate such a thing? Because it just kind of sounds like you're making things up. Or they'll say, well, three and a half years was when the uh, apostles were supposed to go out to preach to the Gentiles, okay? But the fact is, no, they were supposed to go out and preach the gospel to the Gentiles right after Pentecost. They were to go and teach all nations. They were to go out into the world preaching the gospel and making disciples of, of all nations, okay? And so this whole idea of uh, three and a half years after Jesus uh, died is all made up. That people who hold to this theory, they, they don't really know. They don't really have an answer. And it doesn't fit all that nicely. And if you, if you thought it was, if, if it was important, which it is, then you would think there would be at least a single strong, a single clear verse in, let's say, the book of Acts that tells us three and a half years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is what happened. But no, we don't find anything about the stoning of Stephen, or this is when they went out to preach to the Gentiles. This is just classic eisegesis where they're just reading their, in this case, eschatology into, into the text. It, it doesn't fit. Again, Jesus Christ said to go 
out into the world and preach the gospel to all nations. It wasn't another three and a half years of preaching to the Jews. No, it was essentially right away. And so that argument, that whole model just simply. Okay, so let's go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, circle our way back and make sense of everything that's been said in this first roughly, roughly 25 minutes. Okay, so we know that everything that we see in, in these verses, especially verse uh, 26, and the uh, things that will be accomplished in the 70 weeks have to do with Messiah, right? His death, burial, and resurrection. And the bringing in of the millennial kingdom is going to finish the transgression, make an end to sins, make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay? Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. And so he gets a triple anointing. But what I want to make clear <clears throat> is that all throughout the Bible, we have what's called dual and triple prophecy fulfillment. This is so important to understand when it comes to interpreting Bible prophecy. Okay. We have a shadow or an immediate fulfillment with these prophecies oftentimes, and then a more literal and dramatic fulfillment in the end times at a later date. And oftentimes it's a spiritual fulfillment followed by a literal physical fulfillment or a localized fulfillment followed by a future more worldwide fulfillment, something on a grand scale, the appetizer and then the main event. Okay. We find this all throughout scriptures. We find it right in Genesis. When Adam and Eve fell, they were told that if they were to eat from the tree of life, that they would surely die. And so did they die physically right away? No. When they fell, they died spiritually. So there's a spiritual fulfillment, but in the future, years and years later, they died physically. And so you had an immediate fulfillment, spiritual fulfillment, and then you had, which was a shadow to the literal physical death that would come. We see also in the book of Genesis, when Abraham went to sacrifice his son on the altar, God said he would provide himself a lamb. But what did God literally provide in that moment? It was a ram. But this was a dual prophecy fulfillment because in the future, Jesus Christ himself, God manifest in the flesh, would die for our sins, for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the world. And so that was the literal lamb. Jesus Christ, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In the immediate sense, God did provide a ram for sacrifice. Okay, so an immediate fulfillment followed by a uh, future, more literal fulfillment. When it comes to the abomination of desolation, we see a an abomination of desolation, second century BC with Antiochus Epiphanes. We see an abomination of desolation that uh, Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. And we see a, a future abomination of desolation, Revelation 13. But this time the image can talk. And those who don't worship this image worldwide are killed. Is this what happened in second century BC? Is this what happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and the city was destroyed? No. But in the future, we have a more literal and dramatic fulfillment because we have an image and this time it can talk and we can understand technology wise how much we've advanced in 2000 years that there certainly could be an image that could talk. I mean, you're looking at me on an image and I'm talking. Okay, I'm not the abomination of desolation. I'm not trying to say that, but the point is this can make sense in terms of holograms. When you watch a movie, you're watching an image that is talking. Okay, you're looking at your phone. And so the point is when you understand dual prophecy fulfillment in the Bible, you've got an immediate fulfillment followed by a more literal fulfillment in the end times. And I've got a whole presentation on that whole section on that in my in my book. So I'm just giving you a couple easy examples to understand. So yes, when Jesus Christ came in first century AD, the worldwide government or power at the time was the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire was a local one world power, 
but they were the most powerful empire at that time. But they had not extended to all parts of the globe. So Jesus came and he conquered spiritually. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, so he conquered spiritually in first century AD when the Roman Empire was ruling the known world. And as a result, he brought in everlasting righteousness. Again, whosoever believeth in me hath, present tense, everlasting life. And so when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when you trust in him for salvation, you are justified. It's just as if you'd never sinned. Your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. He's made an end to sins. You're regenerated. You're passed from death unto life. You're predestined for glorification. Remember, when it comes to salvation, your various aspects of salvation are what? Justification. Regeneration. Both those aspects of salvation happen in a moment. You're literally born again. Born of the Spirit. Born from above. So your spirit is quickened. It was dead. Now it's alive. You've been passed from death unto life. You're justified. This is a legal declaration. Okay, you have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're being sanctified because we have not yet been gl glorified. Our The salvation of our bodies is future. If you look at yourself in the mirror before you got saved, and then after you got saved, you look the same because nothing changed about your flesh. The redemption of our bodies is future. Future sanctification because we're being sanctified, but eventually we will reach what's called final sanctification, which is glorification when we are changed from corruptible to incorruptible. That happens at the rapture, the first resurrection. So there is a reality in the sense that we are saved because we're justified and regenerated. We are being saved because we're being conformed to the image of a son. We're being sanctified. Sancti sanctification just means to be set apart. Regeneration. To be regenerated. You were generated the first time into this world out of your mother's womb physically. That was your physical birth. You have your genetics of your mom and dad. Okay. 50% of mom's DNA, 50% of dad's DNA in all your cells. When you're regenerated, you're generated again, but spiritually. You're born of God. You're in Christ. And you have essentially the genetics of your heavenly father. Now are ye the sons of God. You've gone from a creature of God to a son of God. You are now set apart. And on this earth, from this temporal vantage point during our Christian walk, we should work more and more at being set apart from the world by walking in the spirit, put on the new man. Paul says, if we live in the spirit, talking about your position, let us also walk in the spirit, talking about your experience. And when you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So in order to not fulfill the lust of the flesh and manifest the works of the flesh, what do you have to do, according to Paul, is walk according to the spirit because you actually have a regenerated spirit to walk in. The unbelieving world, they don't have a regenerated spirit. They're not baptized into the body of Christ. They don't have the chastisement of God. Unbelievers are dead in their spirits. They need to be quickened. They're not indwelt with the Holy Ghost. When you get saved, you go from not having the indwelling of the Holy Ghost to having the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. When you got saved, you went from a state of unregeneration to a state of regeneration. Before you were saved, you did not have chastisement. After you were saved, you now have the chastisement of our Heavenly Father. Okay? And so the point is, there are aspects to our salvation that are that are now the already and not yet we are already saved because we're justified regenerated but we're not yet saved in the sense that we have not yet experienced the redemption of our bodies because the salvation of our bodies is future this is basic soteriology and so basic eschatology is the fact that Jesus Christ conquered spiritually at his first coming at his first coming, there was a worldwide empire. That was the Roman Empire. But in that time, it was more so localized because they have not covered the globe. They had not; Their power had not spread to all parts of, of the planet. Okay? And so there are a lot of local fulfillments at that time. This is when Jesus conquered spiritually. And so he made an end to sins. He stopped the, the necessity of the animal sacrifices. He stopped the animal sacrifices, put an end to it, brought in everlasting righteousness because when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are given everlasting life.
you hath everlasting life. You're predestined for glorification. Okay. Jesus was anointed at his baptism. Sure. He was, but he will in the future be literally anointed as kings and priests and prophets were. He has a triple anointing. And so the point is, yes, in first century AD, Jesus conquered spiritually rules and reigns in the hearts of believers. And in the future, when the 70 weeks ends, this is why it doesn't make any sense for those that say there's no future 70th week of Daniel, because what, so Jesus is cut off in the middle of the week, three and a half years in, but there's three and a half more years. So what happens at the end of that three and a half more years? And the answers don't make sense that are given. Stoning of Stephen, chapter and verse, please. Oh, they're supposed to go to the Gentiles, uh, you know, three and a half years later. No, they're supposed to go to the Gentiles right after Pentecost. They were commanded to preach the gospel to all nations, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize people of all nations. Okay, not three and a half years later. This stuff, unfortunately, is made up. Now, again, this is a secondary non-essential issue. This is what I believe the Bible is clearly saying. But there are those who would hold to pre-mill, pre right? You got pre-millennialism, post-millennialism, amillennialism. And so within, uh, in terms of in-house debate, there are some that would say there's, there's nothing uh, in the future for Daniel's 70th week. It's all been fulfilled. Nothing to see here, folks. What they're not, and, and that's okay in, in the sense that it's a secondary issue. Nothing to split over, nothing to break fellowship over. But what they're missing is the fact that, yes, in a way, there was a Daniel 70th week in from 66 to 73. Because you had the seven-year Jewish-Roman War. It started in 66 AD. Right in the middle of that war, the sacrifice was literally stopped because the people of the prince, the Roman army and Commander Titus verified through history, I've never seen anybody address this perfect correlation. They came in, they destroyed the temple, and they destroyed the city. And there are still three and a half more years left. Okay. But the problem with not understanding that there's also a more literal Daniel 70th week in the future is the fact that, and we need to talk about the context of Daniel to begin with. Okay. Daniel 9. So, what is the context? Well, in the beginning of the chapter, we are told about the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And so rather than 70 weeks, we're looking at 70 literal years. Now we understand that the Israelites return at the end of the 70 years. This is prophesied, right? And Daniel understands from the book of Jeremiah that this is going to be the case. Once again, fulfilled prophecy. Now Daniel also though, he gets a vision of 70 weeks. And so we can find a parallel between the 70 years and the 70 weeks. Now, the 70 years of Babylonian captivity culminates with what? It ends with what? Well, it ends with Israel returning to the promised land, a happy ending. The 70 years basically conclude with, with a happy ending. The 70 weeks, on the other hand, 70 weeks of years, they, not to be confused with the 70 years, they ultimately, when you understand dual prophecy fulfillment, they ultimately culminate with all believers of all time inheriting the promised land for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where Jesus will literally rule and reign with a rod of iron. Okay, one reason why, and I'm going to take a real short detour here. I did a whole presentation refuting amillennialism and postmillennialism. I don't want to rehash that here, but I just want to show people the basic chronology of the book of Revelation to demonstrate why you cannot take Daniel's, or you can't take Revelation 20. You can't stick it in first century AD. Okay, because when you understand the chronology of Revelation, where you've got your tribulation in uh, chapter 6, rapture chapter 7, start of God's wrath chapter 8. Anyways, what you have is a chronology. And when you go to the second half, okay, so you basically got Revelation 1 to 11. It's all the same order. First century AD in chapter one. Then you got tribulation, rapture, wrath. It always goes in that order. Tribulation, rapture, wrath. You know that you, you've gone back in time. So you're getting more details, basically. 
and a reiterating of the same detail, a lot of the same details starting in Revelation 12. You know you're gone, but you know that you're getting the chronology again plus more because in chapter 12, you go back to first century AD with the birth of Christ. Then in uh, Revelation 13, you got the tribulation again, matches up perfectly with Revelation 6 and the seals. Then you get the rapture. Okay, you have uh, one like the Son of Man. You got Jesus Christ on a white cloud with a sickle reaping the harvest of the earth. Clearly the rapture. Revelation 7, you have the great multitude that no man can number of all tongues and all nations. Matches perfectly. Then you have the start of God's wrath. Chapter 15 and chapter 8. And so all of this correlates perfectly. So the point is, Okay, the mark of the beast, the one world government, and the one world religion take place in Revelation 13 and Revelation 6 during your tribulation period. Revelation 13 specifically goes over the details. Okay, now, at the end of God's wrath period, what you have, so basically after hail and fire cast upon the earth, after mountain cast into the sea, after smoke and locusts uh, out of the bottomless pit at the fifth trumpet, Okay, and then after your vials, we have the battle in Armageddon, where Jesus Christ comes on a white horse with all his saints to battle the Antichrist. You have three adversaries. You have the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon, the devil. The, the, the devil. The dragon gives power unto the beast. How can <laughs> how can Satan, who's roaring around like a lion seeking people to devour, how can he be bound? How can he be, the whole point of being sealed in the bottomless pit is so he can't escape. So you can't say, well, he's bound, but he's not really bound. He still has some power. He just doesn't have ultimate power. No, this is ridiculous. He's literally sealed in the bottomless pit so he can't escape. That's the whole point of a key. That's the whole point of being chained. Okay. The dragon gives power unto the beast. How can he give power unto the beast? How has he been working throughout history? as the spirit of Babylon, essentially, if he's been bound. It doesn't make any sense. But the point is, it doesn't work in the chronology because a lot of people, they want to take Revelation 20 and they want to stick it in uh, first century AD. But you can't do that. And they'll say that's when Satan was bound, essentially. No, because you have cause and effect. You have Jesus Christ coming on a white horse to fight these three adversaries. Antichrist and false prophet are defeated. So this is the defeat of the Antichrist and false prophet who rule over the one world government, the one world beast system. When was that? I want to know when that was in first century AD. Where was this mark of the beast? This mark that if you don't take on your right hand or in your forehead, then you can't buy or sell. Some people want to spiritualize that. It's a literal mark that if you don't have, you can't buy or sell. How can you spiritualize that? And it's instituted by this one world power. And so all of this, is taking place. And then in Revelation 19, Jesus comes on a white, white horse, destroys the Antichrist and false prophet in, in, um, in the lake of fire, throws them into the lake of fire, okay, throws them into hell. And then the dragon, the devil, as a result, is bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. And then we rule and reign with Christ. This is the first resurrection because those that were caught up Years before at the rapture, they get to come back down with Jesus in their glorified states where there's literally an end to sin because we're now glorified. We're fully regenerated. We don't even have the only reason you sin right now or suffer with sin, struggle with sin is because of the flesh. Your flesh is not yet regenerated. Remember, the salvation of our bodies is future. And so the literal end to sins for the believer is at glorification. And when we're on this earth, ruling and reigning with Christ physically, we are in a glorified state. Okay, so right now, yes, there is an end to sins. There's everlasting righteousness, but we don't yet have our re regenerated bodies. We don't have our new bodies. So the point is, and Revelation 20 talks about that those who overcame the uh, mark of the beast, those who did not take the mark, those that were slain for not taking the mark, they also get to rule and reign with uh with christ which proves a post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture because believers saints they are experiencing this time where this supposed mark is made mandatory and believers are refusing it believers are being killed and now they're being raised 
to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And so you can't take Revelation 20 and stick it in first century AD because again, you're just taking it right out of its chronology. It's like, take your favorite trilogy, take Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, the Two Towers, the Return of the King. It'd be like taking a random event in Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, which is part three, and then just tossing it right three quarters of the way into Fellowship of the Ring and saying, this is when this happened. No, that completely goes against the chronology. It doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. It's not biblical. It makes no sense. You have the mark of the beast, one world government, one world religion, the reign of the Antichrist and the false prophet, the dragon's the one who gives the Antichrist power, clearly not bound. Then Jesus Christ comes on a white horse for the battle in Armageddon, destroys the Antichrist false prophet, and then throws Satan into the bottom, bottomless pit. So none of that happened in first century AD. And so if you just want to take Revelation 20, throw it into first century AD and say, we've been in the millennial reign ever since, all millennialism, then you're going to have to show me where, when these events took place. Who is the Antichrist? Who is the false prophet? Where was this one world mark that was instituted? And if people didn't take it, they were killed and they couldn't buy or sell. No, this doesn't work. And because it's a chronology, show me hail and fire being cast upon the earth in the past. Show me the, the smoke and locusts coming out of the bottomless pit. Show me this burning star that fell upon the rivers. Show me this mountain that was cast into the sea. Show me the four angels and their armies from the Euphrates River when it was dried up. No, this is all a chronology. This is all future. This is all future, and there's really no way around it. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out as to why you can't take Revelation 20 and put it into first century AD, which means you have to now understand that these prophecies that the 70 weeks will accomplish have a an immediate fulfillment in terms of being fulfilled spiritually, but also a future more dramatic, a literal fulfillment where Jesus Christ will literally be anointed here on this earth. He will literally be ruling and reigning with a rod of iron on this earth. There will literally be an everlasting kingdom because once the thousand years are over and then Satan is loose for a small time and he deceives various people within the nations to rise against God, well, he's going to fail. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And then the new heavens and new earth are here. And so that everlasting kingdom continues on. It's not like the ruling stops. Okay. And obviously Jesus hands the kingdom to, to the father. Okay. And so the point is we have shadow and spiritual fulfillments here. We also have in Jesus, you can even say was anointed at his baptism, but there will be a literal anointing during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, which is future, has to be future. The chronology tells us that. You can't take a random scene in Lord of the Rings, the return of the king that say halfway through and just for no reason, just cut it out, just rip it right out and throw it into Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, which is part one, three quarters in where it doesn't belong. It doesn't fit. It's inconsistent, sloppy. It's unsophisticated. It doesn't work. Okay. So we got to give that one up guys. Anyways. So, um, Antiochus Epiphanes is what I'd like to focus on next, but another reason why, and I kind of drifted off a little bit there, but I'm right back to finishing up my answer as to why there has to be a future, more literal and dramatic fulfillment here. This goes back to the 70 years of Babylonian captivity and how that ended with the Israelites coming back to the promised land, ended with a, a happy ending. Well, when you understand dual prophecy fulfillment, what happened after the seven-year Jewish-Roman war? When the temple was destroyed, the city was destroyed. Well, the Jews were scattered in all nations, okay? There wasn't really a, a major event that took place, okay? It's, it's very much different than what happened at the end of the 70 years. But the 70 weeks, when you understand the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, ends with what? The 70 week ends with a resurrection of the dead. And this resurrection is composed of all saints of all time who will rule and reign with Jesus Christ for 1,000 years. 
And so this is a beautiful shadow fulfillment with the 70 years of captivity being the shadow fulfillment and the 70 weeks being the literal, more dramatic fulfillment. Because the 70 weeks ends with what? The 70 weeks ends with a literal kingdom where there is literally an end to sin because we are in our glorified states. Jesus Christ is here and he is ruling and reigning. He's literally anointed as prophet, priest, and king, a triple anointing. Okay. And so this is why the ultimate fulfillment of Daniel 9 cannot just be Titus, the seven year Jewish Roman war and the destruction of the temple right in the middle of that war to literally put a stop to the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices in 70 AD. So this is all an incredible shadow fulfillment. We know the 70 years ends with restoration of Israel to the promised land. In 73, in 73 AD, we understand that we get the opposite of what we got at the end of the 70 years. There's no correlation. There's no return to the land. There's, as a matter of fact, quite the opposite, a dispersal out of the land. But when we understand the importance, when we recognize dual prophecy fulfillments, the more shadow, the shadow fulfillment and the future end times fulfillment, this makes perfect sense because we have what? We have the Antichrist in the final seven years of history before the millennium. And we know that at the start of the millennium, God's people all believers of all time, all those that have been predestined for glorification because they've trusted and put their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, they will be gathered into the land. That is believers of all time to literally rule and reign. And so now we have a two-part picture of restoration. The first 70 years of Babylonian captivity had the children of Israel outside the land with an eventual return. That's why the 70 weeks in terms of its shadow fulfillment has a gap from 33 to 70 AD. More specifically, 66 AD, because you have that seven-year Jewish-Roman war. It's not until the middle of the war that the actual temple and city are destroyed. And since you have a gap in its shadow fulfillment, then you also have a gap between the first coming of Jesus Christ and the second coming and the millennium. The 70 weeks, therefore, has to end with all believers of all time the Israel of God entering the promised land where they will, they will rule, they will reign with Christ. And again, this is a perfect two-part picture of restoration. And this is incredibly important to, to understand or else you're just going to, you're going to miss out on the fullness of the entirety of what Bible prophecy is telling us. And it can't be any more clear. In the book of Daniel, we understand that the Antichrist will rule for, will continue in power for three and a half years. And then in the book of Revelation, it talks about how the Antichrist continues in power for 42 months. I'm not an expert in calculus, but I can tell you 42 months and three and a half years is the same thing. It's the same thing. And so I want to get to these verses dealing with the taking away of the daily sacrifice. So Daniel's 70th week, we've talked about Titus, the seven year Jewish Roman war. And so a lot of people will say, well, where does Antichrist, where does he take away a sacrifice? Well, again, you have to read Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, 10, 11, 12, get the context. Go back to Daniel 8. Notice this. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Go down to verse 11. Yea, he, going back to the little horn, we understand this is Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a, a Grecian leader who came in. He uh, sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. He set up a statue, statue of Zeus. Okay, this is all recorded in history. And so what we see in terms of Bible prophecy that this man would do, Antiochus Epiphanes, we understand from history, did these things. But he is a shadow. He is a picture of the Antichrist. He is a type of Antichrist. And so all the things he does, the Antichrist does as well. Because remember, we have an appetizer or a shadow fulfillment, and then the end game, a future more dramatic fulfillment. And that's why when people say, well, in the book of Daniel, you see a lot of localized events. Yeah, that's the whole point. Because we have a shadow or localized fulfillment. We have all kinds of localized fulfillments in the book of Daniel. And those are extrapolated in the book of Revelation. Because where there's an analog, 
there's a dual or triple prophecy fulfillment. And we see analogs all throughout Daniel that correlate with Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, and the book of Revelation. And so where there is an analog, we understand there is a dual or even a triple prophecy fulfillment in the case of Antichrist, type of Antichrist, and then the one world Antichrist, and the abomination of desolation. And so we have a global fulfillment in the end times. And so, yes, we are going to see localized descriptions or fulfillments in Daniel. And then that is extrapolated to its end game fulfillment that we read about in the book of Revelation, where it talks about how all tongues, all nations, all peoples, all kindreds are forced to take a mark, are forced to, to worship the beast. And so this is a worldwide uh, persecution at this time. Okay, so right here, notice this. He magnified himself, referring to in its immediate sense Antiochus Epiphanes, but in terms of the uh, literal fulfillment in the future, the Antichrist. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by who? By him, referring back to the little horn, the daily sacrifice was taken away. This is Daniel 8, right before Daniel 9. So if you read Daniel 8, you already know who's taking away the daily sacrifice in Daniel 9. By him, by who? The little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes who is a type of Antichrist. He does all the things that the Antichrist is described to do in the future. So by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. Go to Daniel 9, 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The pronoun he has an antecedent. The antecedent goes back to the people of the prince, the people of the prince that shall come after Messiah is cut off. We understand in 66 to 73 AD to recap, that is commander Titus. He and his people, the Roman army came in, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city, fits perfectly, but we understand this is a shadow fulfillment. This is a localized Daniel 70th week. We also have the future literal Daniel 70th week with the Antichrist. So he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And then in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Go back to Daniel 8. By him, the daily sacrifice was taken away, referring to Antiochus Epiphanes and the Antichrist. Notice this, Daniel 8 again. Okay, by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. This is Antiochus Epiphanes. This is uh, the dragon who's giving power, who's influencing Antiochus Epiphanes. The dragon also influences the end times Antichrist. And so one could say, this is the dragon. This is the devil who's taking away the daily sacrifice, who's setting up the abomination of desolation. Daniel 12. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. The abomination of desolation is an idol being set up. Being set up indicates the idol is being set up by somebody. So somebody's taking an idol, taking an image, and setting it up. Jesus is not setting up an idol. Anyways, Antiochus Epiphanes, you read about him all throughout Daniel 8, all throughout uh, Daniel 11. Um, completely fulfills Daniel 11. And again, we have appetizers to the main event. Antiochus Epiphanes, literally, you uh, they've unearthed coins where he is depicted as being God manifest. He looked to himself as God manifest at how others looked to him as well. He wasn't, obviously, but he looked to himself as God manifest, just like the Antichrist. He steps foot into the temple as God, claiming to be God, just like Antiochus Epiphanes. So he was a Seleucid king of the Hellenistic Syrian kingdom. And he came out of the Grecian Empire, okay? The Seleucid Empire within there. So notice this, the appetizer versus the end game. You can't miss this, guys. This is an amazing correlation right here. Antiochus Epiphanes, the end times Antichrist. Notice how the minor scale, scale fulfillment in reality fits perfectly with your grand scale, future, more dramatic reality. Antiochus Epiphanes sets up the transgression of desolation. It takes away the daily sacrifice. He's the little horn of the Grecian period, the Antichrist of Daniel 8. End times Antichrist also sets up the abomination of desolation, takes away the daily sacrifice. He's talked about in uh, Matthew 24, and he is described in Daniel 7 as being the Antichrist. Here's another perfect comparison. Daniel 11. And the king, this is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and ma magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Sound familiar? Yes, 2 Thessalonians 2. 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. I've done a whole presentation on this verse. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, talking about the Antichrist. There are many Antichrists. We know the Antichrist will come, but there's also many Antichrists because the spirit of Antichrist has always been around. Who opposeth and exalteth himself. Notice, just like Antiochus Epiphanes, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. The Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. That he as God, he as God, sitteth in the temple of God. Notice capital G. Because a lot of people that say, oh, this rebuilt temple in the end times, that's not going to be a, a, of God. Of course it's not going to be of God. But notice this, speaking about the man of sin, that he as God, capital G. Is he God? No, he's not God. But the world is going to see him as God. The world is going to worship him as God. He is going to be so convincing that Matthew 24 says, if it were possible, if it were possible, he shall deceive even the very elect. We are elect through faith in Christ Jesus. And so the elect are believers, those glorified or those predestined for glorification. And so it is impossible. It is saying if it were possible, he will be so convincing that if it were even possible, he would deceive the very elect. It's saying that it's not possible. It's impossible for the Antichrist to deceive the very elect. But the point is, he's not actually God. And so when it says, that he sits in the temple of God, capital G. That doesn't mean the temple is of God. Of course it's not God, of God. It's an evil, wicked temple, but it is, one could say, where the Antichrist will set himself up to be worshipped as God. And so your elitists working to get an Antichrist into power, they have every reason to want a rebuilt temple. Okay? And... The ultimate reason is right here, because this is the abomination of desolation. This is the moment he will be revealed as the Antichrist. Notice this, Revelation 13, now talking about the future Antichrist. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Again, we had an abomination of desolation in second century BC with Antiochus Epiphanes. He set up a statue of Zeus. And he also supposedly offered up a pig upon the altar. And I think I have a citation for that here. So notice this, Antiochus Epiphanes, supposedly God manifest. And he, I find this interesting too. Not that we should, okay, so right here. In 168 BCE, Antiochus marched to Jerusalem, slew Jason the uh, last of the, the high priest, and de dedicated the temple to Zeus. He erected an image of Zeus in his own likeness on the altar. Some sources say that he sacrificed a pig. There it is. Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of Syria, captured Jerusalem in 167 BC, desecrated the temple by offering the sacrifice of a pig on an altar to Zeus, the abomination of desolation. So we had an abomination of desolation in what? In second century BC. 168 roughly BC. This image speak? No, this image could not speak. And so this is where you have to understand dual prophecy fulfillments in the Bible. Because in the end times, remember Revelation 13 is written long after the events comprising Revelation 13 are not the events of something that happened before Jesus's birth with Antiochus Epiphanes. No, because we had an abomination of desolation in the past but we have an analog because a lot of people say, well, there's some pre-mill proponents that take the dual prophecy fulfillment reality too far. And that's true. Some people take it too far. But when you have an analog from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you know that there is a reality here of a dual and even triple prophecy fulfillment. And so we see an abomination of desolation in second century BC with Antiochus Epiphanes. We see in 73 AD a type of, of abomination of desolation in a way because uh, the Roman army came in, Commander Titus came in, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the city, okay? Um, and then we have here Revelation 13, which is after both those events. We have another abomination of desolation, but this time, since it's in the future, remember Daniel says that by the end times, knowledge shall be increased. People will go to and fro, and that's what we're seeing today. I mean, you could just pick up your phone and you can find 
a, a website or a source or link to basically any kind of question that you have. We are, um, we have so much information at our expense. Okay. We're just stimulated with an abundance, an overwhelming amount of information because information has increased. And so technology today, we understand that yes, technology could allow for this to take place where there's an image like Antiochus Epiphanes set up, but this time it's not just an idol statue of Zeus. No, this time it's an image that possibly through a hologram or something advanced can speak. And that's pretty scary to think about, but we read about this in Revelation 13. So Antiochus Epiphanes, localized fulfillment, right? The appetizer. Notice Daniel 8, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, because it's by the dragon. Oh, notice this, the future Antichrist. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So again, you have the dragon. How could you say that Satan is bound for a thousand years when it's Satan that is literally giving power unto the beast? <clears throat> At a time where he's supposed to be bound. Supposedly we're in this millennial reign, according to all millennialists. Well, he's bound, but he's not really bound. He's bound by a bungee cord, apparently. No, he is literally sealed. Revelation 20 has certain elements that tell us, no, during this time, he's literally sealed away so he can't escape. He's bound, he's chained, he's not influencing the nations at that time. That's future. But here he is not bound because he is literally giving power <clears throat> under the beast, under the Antichrist, under this one world system in the same way that in second century BC, he was giving power unto the anti or unto Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a type of Antichrist. But everybody, both or all uh, pre mill, post mill, and all mill proponents would agree that in second century BC, when he was giving power to, Ant to Antiochus Epiphanes, he wasn't chained, he wasn't bound. So why is it any different in Revelation 13 when he's doing the exact same thing by giving power unto the beast? by influencing the beast, by manifesting his wickedness through the beast. Because he's not bound, my friends. He's not bound. Notice this here in uh, Daniel 11. An arm shall stand on his part and they shall, notice this, they, third person plural pronoun, they, shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. This is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes and shall take away the daily sacrifice. So notice here, we have more details. Antiochus Epiphanes, but his army or his followers, those that fight for him, they're specifically taking away the daily sacrifice by going into the temple with him as the leader. And then they are placing the abomination that maketh desolate. This heavy image, this heavy idol, this uh, statue of Zeus, okay? But notice how it says, they shall pollute the sanctuary. This correlates perfectly with verse 26 of Daniel 9. Preterists love to isolate verses and ignore the context. But notice this, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, sub substitutionary atonement, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, because we understand from 33 AD to 66 AD, there's a gap. But in 66 AD, the start of that Jewish Roman war, that's what we see. Commander Titus leading the way leading the way with the Roman army. They go in, they destroy the temple, they destroy the city. In this verse, Daniel 9, 26, we have the people of the prince destroying the city and the sanctuary. Correlates perfectly with what Antiochus Epiphanes did in Daniel 11. Again, there is an application in Daniel 11 for the end times as well, okay? This is why, again, you have to understand dual prophecy fulfillment, and then eschatology will flow beautifully. Okay, so we have the people of the prince destroying the city. History confirms this. And the sanctuary, those people referring to the Roman army under the command of Titus beginning uh, between 66 and 73. And in the end times, the Antichrist armies, remember everything Antiochus Epiphanes did, the Antichrist is going to do as well. But what Antiochus Epiphanes did was on a local scale. It was a minor fulfillment a minor scale, but in the future, it'll be on a grand scale. It'll be the end game. It won't just be the appetizer. It'll be the main course. It'll be the steak and potatoes, <laughs> not just the soup and bread or salad and bread. 
The fact it says they in both Daniel 9 and 11 precludes the he of Daniel 9, 27 as being Jesus Christ. Guys, this, it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. If Daniel 8 is saying that the dragon is taking away the daily sacrifice at that time through Antiochus Epiphanes, in the future through the Antichrist, if Daniel 11 is saying that the dragon and his armies, again, at that time, through Antiochus Epiphanes, is taking away the daily sacrifice and setting up the abomination of desolation. And Daniel 12 is saying the same thing. Then you can't just look to Daniel 9 and say, well, here there's an exception and I have no justification. The context tells us that the one taking away the daily sacrifice, the one setting up the abomination of desolation is who it's always been, the dragon influencing different leaders, different evil and wicked and unregenerate leaders like Antiochus Epiphanes, like Titus, and like the future Antichrist. So I wanted to, I find it interesting, not that we should take <laughs> the apocryphal books as authority by any means. I just find it interesting that history confirms what I'm saying, the Bible confirms what I'm saying. And if you go to 1 Maccabees, notice what it says. And there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus Epiphanes, <laughs> And notice what it says here. In those days went there out of Israel wicked men, because we understand there was apostates at that time that hated the true God, the God of Israel. And they worked with Antiochus Epiphanes. They made a league with him. They made an agreement with him. And so notice what it says here. Let us go and make a covenant. Because you hear a lot of people that are... um that would say there, there's nothing to do with Daniel's 70th week in the future. They'll say, where does the uh, Antichrist make a covenant? Well. Antiochus Epiphanes made a covenant. We understand that. Let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us. For since we departed from them, we had much sorrow. I just think that's interesting. But the greater question, where does Antichrist make a covenant? Well, what is a covenant? Covenant is essentially a deal or an agreement made with someone. Okay. What's another word for covenant? League or agreement. Daniel 11. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. That's what we understand the Antichrist will do. He will make an agreement. He will make a league or a covenant with many. He will make promises, but then he will work deceitfully. He will go against those promises. This is exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did as well. Remember, everything Antiochus Epiphanes did on a local scale, the Antichrist will do on a global scale. On a grand scale, we have the minor scale versus the grand scale. And you can't say that there's no justification for the, for this because there are analogs from the, new, from the Old Testament to the New Testament for everything that I am saying. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. But notice this, after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. What is a league? Notice this, go to definition of league, dictionary.com. Certainly not a... Uh, evangelical Christian website. Number one, a covenant. So where does the Antichrist make a covenant? Daniel 11, he makes a covenant. History confirms he's made a covenant. First Maccabees, not that it should be taken as any kind of authority. I just find it interesting that there you go, he's making a covenant. And so a covenant or comp, see, context, context is everything. There's a fallacy called the illegitimate totality transfer fallacy, where you see a word and you assume that it means the same thing in every uh, instance. Yeah. God makes covenants. People makes co make covenants. Uh, wicked rulers and leaders make covenants. The context will dictate who is making the covenant and what the covenant is. And the context of Daniel 9, when you read Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 10, 11, 12, you know that the one making the league or the covenant is the dragon who makes a league through Antiochus Epiphanes in second century BC and makes a league through the Antichrist in the future. Notice this definition of league. A league is a type of treaty where people join together. Isn't that interesting? The example that they give the League of Nations, or I should say the, yeah. So you have the League of Nations. Well, we understand that the Antichrist forms a league and then de deals deceitfully. This is him confirming the covenant with many for one week. In the middle of this seven-year period, the Antichrist essentially goes back on what he agrees he would do. 
Is it any coincidence that the book of Revelation tells us that the Antichrist continues in power for 42 months, which is three and a half years? Why do we find all throughout the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, why do we see halves of seven years? We see components of seven years, never anything over seven years. We have time, times, and the dividing of, of, of times. We have 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days, 1335, 1290. These are all numbers that are aspects of a seven-year period. This is not a coincidence, guys. We are looking at a seven-year period from 66 to 73 AD, and we're looking at a seven-year period in the end times because we have a shadow and we have a literal fulfillment in the end times. Daniel 11 is a very deep and complicated chapter and comprises a dual prophecy. These verses in Daniel 11 have an application in 2nd century BC with Antiochus Epiphanes. But it also has an end times application that points to the Antichrist and his rise to power. Remember, there was an abomination of desolation with Antiochus Epiphanes, a type of abomination of desolation with Titus, since he destroyed the temple, but also a future and more dramatic abomination of desolation that Jesus and the book of Revelation talk about in the end times with the Antichrist and the rebuilt third temple. Daniel 11 is a more than sufficient answer to this commonly repeated challenge. And I think we're going to wrap it up there because I could go on and on and on and on and on. This is just a sneak peek into the overall material that I have discussing this issue of Daniel's 70th week, the Antichrist, who is the he of Daniel 9.27, and going over the chronology of the last days. And so guys, please share this content around because the truth is important. I do want to remind everybody that this is eschatology. This is not an essential issue. This is not the deity of Christ. This is not salvation by faith alone. This is not the Trinity. This is simply a secondary issue, but it is still an important issue because we don't want to fall into believing in a false eschatological position because a lot of these false positions, they unfortunately remove Christian preparation. But the pre-mill position, the post-tribulation pre-wrath position, this biblical position prepares Christians for the rise of the Antichrist. And so with that, God bless all.